Perfect. Great. Ooh. And I get the whole couch. <laughs> Wonderful. Welcome, everybody, and welcome you. We have a very, very exciting panel because I think it's a topic that is super important, especially to address here at NOAA conference because we have many startups, of course, many of them looking for venture funding, looking to work with investors together, and still we're reading a lot of articles in the press about the differences from the U.S. venture ecosystem and here in Europe. And we have really two amazing guests with Karen, with Andre here, who are very experienced experienced investors coming from different backgrounds, of course, Intel, more the corporate view. We have Andre as uh, one, I think, the top brands in venture capital from Silicon Valley, but also with offices in um, London and in other cities. So we have really the experts, and I encourage you to ask also questions. If you have questions, just raise your hand. We want to make it very um, interactive, and we really want to address the ideas and questions that you have maybe in mind and want to use the opportunity to ask. And this topic is especially also important from a viewpoint that more and more European companies become bigger and bigger and want to conquer the world. And of course, we want to understand how VCs can help them, how can VCs also help them in globalization with the network, with their contacts. So let's get right into it. Karen, great to have you here. Welcome you. to Berlin. You are um, quite new to Berlin and here in Europe. Welcome, especially. You. And you made already also investments. You invested in Volocopter, uh, for example, here, and also in a uh, Glove company, uh, IoT, Glove? Yeah. kind of uh, robotics, yes. oh, yeah, David, in, in Munich. So you're um, quite active and focusing, looking very deep here in the European market. Maybe you give us uh, some insights um, as you're coming from the U.S. and know the U.S. market very well. What kind of difference you see when you talk to founders, to entrepreneurs here in Europe? Yeah, so um, I moved here. Wow, that is really super loud. You can turn that down. Um, so I moved here last year, moved the husband and the cat, and I've had a year to observe the European market, um, and I participate uh, in growing a lot of different companies. The difference here is that we know that there's a lot of deep tech here. What people don't really understand from Silicon Valley to here is that it's undervalued. If you want your dollar, your investing dollar to go further, come shopping throughout Europe, not just the hubs of Germany, uh, of France, of Switzerland and London. All over has fantastic tech. So take a risk, come here. Yeah, and especially in Germany, we see a very decentral landscape, right? Yes. You have Karlsruhe, you have many other cities. So how you figure it out? I mean, in the US, it's very clear. You go first Silicon Valley, right? And then you go from there. But how do you manage it to find really the interesting deals, the interesting companies, uh, and really be the truffle pick here? Ah, so, so I used to start by um, doing incredible trips, uh, a lot of different countries. But this, like everyone says, this is a relationship game. And so trading deal flow with people I trust is really very important. So other VCs, we play nicely with financials, we play nicely with strategics, but people that I've done deals with before, we absolutely will trade companies. And then you have to absolutely be known by the CEOs, by the ecosystem, by the companies themselves, um, and build that trusting relationship. Andre, maybe you can shortly also introduce um, yourself, your focus at uh, Axel, and then tell us also a little bit, uh, because you're, of course, helping a lot of European companies expanding to the US, building the headquarters there, etc. Give us a little bit insight in your world. Sure, happy to. So uh, as some of you may know, Axel is a US venture firm, Roots in the Valley, and we've been in London, in Europe, uh, since 2000. So we've been early believers in the fact that entrepreneurship is uh, you know, truly global. Um, and a lot of what we do in Europe is backing founders with global ambitions. Um, and specifically in Germany, we've helped a number of companies make that jump to the US uh, when it comes to accessing a much larger market. Um, so we were early backers of Salonis in Munich. Um, you know, in, in Berlin, we've backed companies like Sender or Rasa or Dash Dash uh, in the last couple of years. Um, and we're very, you know, very much stage agnostic. We're, we're, we love, you know, in Germany, we've backed companies in Berlin, in Munich, in Zollingen, in Karlsruhe, in, in Cologne. Um, so we're happy to be on planes and find the best entrepreneurs, um, you know, in, in the key themes we're exploring. Can you maybe give us a concrete uh, case study, an example that really helped, um, for example, German company going to the US and what your personal 
partners on it? Do you help them to find an office space, or is it more about then recruiting, um, getting the right contacts? So, what is your role when a company, let's say Salonis, for example, saying we want to open our SUS headquarters in New York, for example? What is the process? How can we imagine or envision what your involvement as a VC is? Sure. So we we run a very lean team. So we have six partners in London, uh, around 10 or so in the US, um, and our focus is very much on helping uh, the key points in a company's life. So Salonis, for example, they bootstrapped themselves for a few years in Munich. Uh, we backed them when there were around 60 people. Um, it was Germany only, selling only to German customers. Um, and the way we help, we we you know, we had spent a lot of time in enterprise automation and helped them build those ties in the ecosystem in the US. Uh, we helped hire um, a CMO, an experienced CMO with an um, ex-background in business intelligence at Click. Um, we also brought a, alongside another board member. So we kind of helped build a team around the strong three founders who, who are very, uh, very impressive, but also quite inexperienced. Um, and <laughs> since then, they've moved their HQ to New York, built a team of over 600 people. Um, and we've been very much helping them in those strategic decisions they haven't, they've had to take along the way. Wonderful. Well, the, quite the opposite of that. We do not have a lean team. We have 100,000 of the biggest brains in the world and thousands of customers and suppliers. So what we bring when somebody wants to come from Europe or from China into the US markets, we open up entirely to them to help them develop their technology if they're younger stage or help them go to market. The, everybody can promise the, the Rolodex, if you're as old as I am, or the contacts, but you actually have to have those networks and the commitment and the headcount to do it. And maybe in your case, ProGlove, which is more like a startup, it's not a big established tech company so far, or Series B, C, et cetera. Um, it's really a, a typical, I would say, German industrial tech uh, startup. Mm -hmm. um, on the, the more early stage side. So what is the process over the next uh, year that they can envision working with Intel? Is it really that you connect them with clients, for example, or you take them to events, or is there any value add that you can bring really from the Intel ecosystem? Is there any value add? Tons of value add. Then yeah. use the Or we wouldn't be in this promoter. business, right? <laughs> so, so we do something, uh, our own Intel technology days, where we invite our customers and suppliers in to our portfolio companies. It is not just hiring, recruiting, management, or board members, or interests. It's, it's really helping them create their own uh, ecosystem to, for sales. So it's not just ProGlove, it's Volocopter. Do you have connections you know, with the FAA or EASA? Policymakers. Right, right. So do you have contacts in the government? Um, so you have to have that commitment behind it, and you actually have to have the influence to be able to do that. And when we look at a company like Intel, um, has it to be always a kind of also strategic fit that you say, or that could be useful for our clients, or is it also like a financial that you say, hmm, maybe it's not that uh, direct fit with our clients, our core business, but we like the team, we like the company, we learn maybe something or gather data? Well, um, I love to make money. Uh, and that we're in that business. So if there is a strategic fit to Intel, it's not just about hardware. It's anything that creates a ton of data, right? Creates, stores, transmits, protects amount of data. So more data, more devices, more devices, more data centers. More data centers, Intel stock price goes up, and I retire early. So it's a really fabulous plan. Yeah, with the cat, of course. With yeah. the cat, of course, and the husband. <laughs> Um, Andre, um, when we talk about uh, the cultural differences, and you're based in London uh, mainly, but you see, of course, founders all over the world, um, is there anything where you feel that it's valuable to share with the, with the audience, where you say, hey, when we have a German company, a European company going to the US, there are also some of cultural challenges sometimes? Yeah, so we're very, um, I would say we're very agnostic when it comes to background. Um, you know, we, we are very big believers in certain themes we're exploring. Uh, so I mentioned enterprise automation, you know, open source developer tools, you know, big consumer categories are, are, are some examples. And we try to find the best founders across the world to back. Um, when it comes to Europe, we're happy to hustle. So we back the company in Perm, Russia, Zollinger in Germany, Aarhus, Denmark, Bucharest, Romania. So we're... Um, you know, we're, we're big believers that you can start a company anywhere, and then with the right resources and advice, you can build it into a global company. So UiPath is an example where we back them out of Bucharest. 
100 people. Now, um, you know, they've grown into um, a very large business in New York, uh, $7 billion valuation, and all that in a couple of years with our help in building the team. Um, I would say what's interesting in Europe is that you definitely have founders uh, coming from more or less traditional backgrounds. So while in, in the Valley you could build a great venture firm just backing founders ex Dropbox, ex Facebook, and maybe having gone to Stanford or Berkeley, here a lot of the best companies we've backed um, you know, are, are started by founders out of you know, a, a very good but less well-known technical school um, you know, in, a, in Aachen or uh, it can be, um, you know, f folks from consultancy background. So it's, we ca you kind of have to be much more open-minded towards um, people with very different experiences. Um, so you, 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 we look at the core traits of what makes a great entrepreneur. And when you look um, at the signaling, when an investor with a brand name, with a household name, at least in our community, um, goes into a company, do you feel still there is kind of um, yeah, curiosity that in other uh, VCs follow that makes it easier their life? Also when like a European company goes um, to the US, that they say, oh, if Excel is invested then, or Intel, which is obviously also a great brand, that it helps them opening doors, hiring people, or say, as long as it's a company, a founder team, that's enough. Oh, that of course helps them. I mean, you, you notice a lot, there's a big step change in hiring, um, especially in the US, on the coast, the competitive environment is so high for talent that um, people will only jump ship if you have a strong backing and they think the company is going places. Um, and it, it's, it's not just optics, it's also, you know, we believe in the value we can provide and uh, we hope we can definitely take companies on a different path um, once we're on the board and work closely with the founders. Mm. Karen, Intel is a true global company on, present on all um, yes. uh, continents. And there was a lot of uh, written for journalists in the last couple of months about there's mainly a battle between the US and China. And kind of Europe is lost in, in the middle, right? There are not so many unicorns, etc. In the list of the top uh, most valuable tech companies, they're not even in the top 20, etc. So, what do you think is the real strength that European founders can bring on the table and really make it up between the two giants, the U.S. and China? Gosh, that's such a broad question. Pitting one, you know, territory to another. We're here to find great techs, uh, great founders build those companies, get them to an exit, make money, repeat cycle. Um, so whether they're from China, Israel, Europe, US, I don't care. Because they usually want to move somewhere else, so open up the markets to them. The governments are going to have issues between themselves. I'm not going to get involved in it. I'm going to grow big, big and beautiful companies. But especially here, as you see so many founders, do you see sp a special kind of um, topics or kind of talents where you see that specific that I only see in Europe that really makes Europe special? Andre, as you knock it, please uh, feel free to join. I mean, go ahead. If you have oh, I, I think about Germany it. is special in so many ways. So I think CDTM, I'm, I'm a huge fan of. And I was talking to a few CDTM founders yesterday. I think you'd build an amazing venture firm just backing CDTM founders. Um, so Salonis was CDTM and, and Personio and a few other companies. Um, I think there's strong strength around the SAP ecosystem. We see um, lots of companies who have ridden on the coattails of SAP and grown as partners of SAP, and they're actively nurturing a startup community around them. Uh, there's clearly uh, you know, lots of folks who've, who've grown from the rocket world who build that operational muscle and are now starting really interesting product companies in Berlin. Uh, there's a really interesting open source hub in Berlin, which is quite unique and has a lot to do with the, with the culture around um, you know, independence and kind of free spirit you have in the city. Um, so it's, what's amazing about Germany and, and Europe in general is that you have all these interesting pockets which could not emerge anywhere else. And uh, we're, we're very keen on understanding the local uh, culture and what makes those hubs special and really back the, the best founders um, in those communities. 
as we're especially talking about bridging the Atlantic, what are your best tips? When is the right timing, the right point to say, okay, now I'm going global. That sometimes can be too early, sometimes can be too late. I know in the early days of the Web 2.0, there was a lot of also Silicon Valley uh, companies that waited very long until they came to Europe, and then was a lot of copycats uh, here already. So what is your thought and your advice in terms of timing at the right moment where you say, okay, now I should uh, tackle the US especially? It's individual for every company and every company's product. But you know, know what your exit is. Know why you're going, not just because somebody on your board says it's time to go. Think through it. Discuss with all of your experts. And you'll know we're at the right time. And from, from the experiences of the companies that you helped already going uh, to the US, um, what is the really big need? Is it, is it talent? Is it sometimes they start first with sales operations, um, for example, when it comes to this actual bridging? Yeah. What are you, are there patterns? It's not, it's not um, picking New York or California, and it's not getting an office. It's, it is talent, right? It's somebody who knows maybe the regulation in the US, um, if it's dependent on that. Somebody who knows the market. So absolutely about talent. Yeah, I agree. It's the, with Karen, the stories are very individual. I would say there's interesting distinctions between consumer and enterprise. On the consumer side, I think it's been proven on and on that you can build really massive businesses in Europe alone, and you know, mm -hmm. Deliver Hero and and um, you know many others, Deliveroo are, are I great examples. <laughs> Data yes. artisans, yes. yeah. <laughs> um, but I think in in software, it's a bit different. Where for every dollar that gets spent uh, from, by enterprises, 50% is in the US. Um, and I do think it, you know, for enterprise software, it's key to be in the US. And for that, we look a lot more on product leadership and ability to be in those conversations and, and win um, these customers. Uh, so I say that we're specifically focused on this Europe to US um, transition more for software. And how can we envision it when a company, Salonis or, or many of your other companies, um, feeling, oh, now it's the right time. They're really discussing with you in depth their business plan for the US. And you say, oh, guys, I can help you here, here, and there. Or they're coming just with questions and inform you <laughs> that they're going. Or how can we envision this relationship? I mean, that's a big premise of the round from the beginning. So we, for example, in enterprise software, we would only get involved if that's a key reason they want to raise, and we would help them in that transition. Um, because you know, it, that's very much a, uh, a crossroads point where you can take the company in many ways, and the way our model works is very outlier-driven, and we're very much focused on the highest upside path. And um, you know, for some companies, that's the right thing to do, and in that case, we get involved. And Karen, if there are no global ambitions, it's also not the right thing for you. Well, and, and in going back to its company specific, there was a company that we advised not to go to the US. They weren't ready. Um, can't say which one. But um, you, know, you, you participate fully and with an open heart and open brain on the board. And I like to tell people, you know, you're not just choosing a brand. Intel, others, you're choosing the person who's going to be on the board. And I also tell them, look, if you don't like me in the first 30 minutes, you sure as hell are not going to like me on your board. I'm an American. I'm really blunt. I have no filter. Ask my friends. Um, but we're going to have those conversations early and often about how the company grows and expands. And it's not just about the US. Perhaps another market would be better. Yes. Intel is so global, um, how close are the corporations and what can the founders expect when it comes to Asia or other markets outside um, the US? Is it just one phone call um, away if they need something, or how can we internally? It know, depends on the time yeah. zone. I'm not waking somebody up. But yes, uh, approximately one phone call away. We're in Israel. We're in China. We have teams there. Um, you know, we have teams around the world. And if we don't have a team, likely we have a technical team there. Oh, so. Thank you. Are there questions from the audience? Nobody raised so far their hand, but maybe there are. First question, do you have a mic uh, for questions? Otherwise, it's a bit thing for everyone not to understand. Do you have a microphone? I see people in black running around. No. Here, first, <laughs> first row. We would need a microphone in the first row. It's coming.
Do you have a microphone? Oh, you have just one? Oh. Oh, <laughs> he took the microphone with him, okay. <laughs> From your perspective, what are the three critical success factors for a startup? In general, or? Uh, for European startups in particular. Whether it's European or, or anywhere else, it's going to be the team, the technology, and the readiness of the market. It's, it's really simple. You can fluctuate those levers a little bit, have a younger team, but you better have some gray hair. I'm not going to say gray beard, but some gray hair advising them. Um, the technology, if the market's not ready for the technology, it's a no-go. It, it can be a science project. Um, and if your product doesn't really match what people are willing to buy, you've got a technology that you spend a lot of money developing. Andre, your three tips. Um, it's a very random <laughs> question, but maybe you focus a little bit on the globalization. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, first of all is the um, I think it very much comes down to the founder's ambition and what type of business they want to build. Um, and success can be defined in many ways. It can be a, an amazing um, lifestyle, profitable business you own 100% of, or it can be a venture-backed business you raise hundreds of million dollars for, and you race like a mad man or mad woman for 10 years. And uh, first, I think first thing is just figuring out what type of business you want to build and um, define success that way. Second, I think focusing on an interesting market opportunity um, where you have an e a unique insight into. Oftentimes, we see great founders being able to um, kind of envision the future in a way that's um, beneficial to them. And, and uh, great founders create market and, and see around corners um, when it comes to where an interesting market opportunity may arise. Um, and, very, uh, and the third, I think, is ability to hire. Uh, it's, we, we see on and on that the biggest um, factor that slows down companies is their uh, inability to attract the best people or retain the best people. Um, so kind of building that culture from the beginning that attracts really amazing folks you know, to join your mission, I think is key. Yeah. Very important point. So as we have a bit short on mics here, just stand up and scream it to us. I think it's the easiest thing. Otherwise, it's a bit lagging. Any more questions? Please, just scream it to us. Uh, So for the guys in the back, the question was the one number one characteristic of a great founder. Enthusiastic, positive vibe. I mean, you will swim through an ocean of no. And every day you're, you're solving problems that are unsolvable. Um, so you have to keep that positive mindset and then project it to the entire team over and over and over again. So if you don't have it to begin with or you're a very pessimistic person, it's going to be really hard to build a company. And for culture, if you're not positive, you're going to infect everybody else. So if you want to build a, a energetic team that's going to work nights, weekends, etc., you got to bring that to them. Andre, anything to add? Yeah, I would have, uh, pro I, I think similar thoughts, I would have called it relentless, but uh, yeah, it's very much the ability to break through walls, and um, especially as you have many moments of doubt and yeah. issues coming down the road, you want to, the entire premise of starting the business kind of has to start from deep within, such that you won't question your decision at the lowest points, and if, if you're just, um, you know, super aligned on what you need to do and what the end goal is, then you'll be able to stomach all these difficult periods. So a little bit of being patient and persistent at the same time. Yeah? Please. So the question is about the fragmentation of the European market and if the VC is helping also going within Europe, um, expanding their business and not just over the Atlantic. 
Yeah, it's not cookie cutter. Um, that would be insane to just say US, US, US. It has to be, you know, what is appropriate for the company and that company's product and whatever is going on in the environment right then. So, absolutely. It depends on what technology you're using. I mean, if you're, if you're an eVITAL company and you have to deal with EASA, it has reciprocity across all, all the EU. But if there's a GDPR issue, um, that also is the EU, but then there's individual country privacy laws. So again, it's product specific. Yeah, so for sure, and it very much depends by company. For example, we backed uh, this company called Cree, or Cree, uh, as Swedes pronounce it. It's, um, uh, telemedicine, the leading telemedicine platform in Europe. They started in Sweden, and you know, as, as you can imagine, it's a highly regulated um, ecosystem. So they've you know, expanded into France and, and the UK and trying in Germany and, and a few other countries. So it's definitely a scaling story where you have to really be thoughtful about operations and onboard, onboarding doctors and uh, attracting patients and so on, hiring local teams, but also navigating the regulatory environment. Um, and you know, that's something we get involved with and help. Versus other companies like Deliveroo, it's less of a, I mean, there is a, a bit of a regulatory issue, but it's a lot more around building that scaling playbook uh, and executing really well on hiring the local teams in the local cities, getting restaurants on board, launching very quickly, um, and yeah, building the business, but yeah. And Andreas, you are from London. Of course, we have to ask you the Brexit question. What is your uh, point of view? Will it um, affect the startup ecosystem or your investment behavior? Or is there anything you want to add to this? Yeah, I would say not much has changed. Um, it's, uh, we continue seeing great founders across Europe. We, um, I would say historically we've invested around 20, 25% of our European efforts in the UK. And that hasn't changed. Um, you know, I think the, the strength of the UK has been very much driven by London being as amazing magnet for talent. And so you say I for our industry, it will not... I still think it's a great city to live in. Um, so I don't, I don't see that changing. Okay, thank you. Mm. Any more questions from the audience? Please, go ahead. Talking about Eastern European companies, or yeah. Yeah, Eastern and Nordics also. Okay. Like they're like a bit on the frontiers in other countries. Mm -hmm. What the challenges? What the fight? Okay. So we're talking about the countries Eastern Europe, Latvia, um, the Nordics, etc. So. Yeah. So so when I'm more, more mobile, I do take trips and hit all of those countries. And you're absolutely right. You know, there's a lot of good software in Romania and Hungary. There's a lot of good robotics in Estonia. In fact, they have a festival. Um, you swing up into Helsinki. Um, I think a lot of us here go to Slush um, for shopping for companies. So. It, it, it kind of doesn't matter where it is, we'll go to them. The other thing is, like I said, you know, the VC friends share deal flow. So if I hear of a good company, I'm on a plane, fortunately living in a great city like Berlin, I can get in and out of Tegel very quickly. Um, so yeah, if, if we have people from you know, uh, those areas, let me know, talk to me after, that'd be great. great. Yeah, Any no, investments? As you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from Romania. Um, and I would say we're we're very we we we're very agnostic around uh, the where the company has come from. So we back UiPath in Romania, Vito in Russia, Prezi in Hungary, um, oh, yeah, all across. So we're I think a key thing is um, helping founders maybe a bit extra uh, in showing them what great looks like. Um, oftentimes these folks will not be surrounded by more mature founders who've seen the journey before. So you just want to make sure you expose them to greatness. Um, but do you see there's also a mind shift from US VCs? I remember a couple of years ago, there was still, if there's a bridge, we don't invest. So like, um, if it's too far away or there's no direct flight to the city, we will not invest in things like uh, these kind of habits. Do you feel 
the US VCs, I mean, you are of course based here, but uh, there are more and more US VCs see the opportunity and now will maybe open an office or fly here or see the big opportunities that Europe has to offer. I would love it if less US VCs came. Of course, of better course. Better for You're me. So selfish. Stay yeah. home. <laughs> You don't share the secrets, yeah, with your colleagues in yeah, the Valley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it will fly. Yeah. We'll be there. And that's why I'm based out here. Uh, and we have a team, so. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think there has been a mind shift very much driven by uh, the performance of many uh, of European companies. I think people couldn't believe a $10 billion plus company could be created out of Europe. And now we're seeing multiple of them and multiple on the way. Um, and this naturally attracts attention. Uh, you also see certain hubs emerging. You know, for example, UiPath, lots of folks have become or are on the path of becoming millionaires, which is in Romania is a um, dollar million uh, millionaires, which in Romania is a great thing. And all these folks will start as angels and kind of feed back into the ecosystem. So you have you know, all these second generation hubs emerging. Um, so yeah, it's a bit delayed versus the US, but I definitely see that only increasing. And then capital is much more mobile. Distribution of companies is also much um, stronger. So we'll... we'll We'll continue seeing the best capital, finding the best opportunities across the world. Great. I can speak of all of us. I think you're more than welcome to spend your VC money here in Europe. We're very much looking forward to it. Karen, Andre, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you on stage. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Should I do it anyhow? Okay. <laughs> thank you.